Welcome to Mosaic Minds. Today we have a very special show. We have one of the most underrated players in the history of basketball and Hall of Fame player, Rick Barry. We also have another special guest. We have Jason's son, Harrison, with us today. And he is on the show because he's a huge Rick Barry fan and he has some questions for Rick Barry himself. So we invited him to come along for the ride. So you're not going to want to miss this. Stay tuned and enjoy the show. Compliment to you. You're the first person in all these years they've done that actually understands that that's, that's the, yeah, I've been called arrogant. Okay. I am not an arrogant person. An arrogant person to me is someone who really lacks confidence in themselves. And it's a camouflage mechanism to hide the fact that they're scared shitless. Welcome to Mosaic Minds, the podcast where every episode is a colorful blend of perspectives, ideas, and conversations. Join us as we delve into a mosaic of topics ranging from the profound to the lighthearted, the thought-provoking to the downright random. Each week, our diverse team of hosts brings their unique backgrounds, experiences, and interests to the table. Mosaic Minds is your invitation to join the conversation to see the world through a kaleidoscope of viewpoints. So grab a seat, tune in, and let the mosaic unfold before you. Hello. Hey, Rick. How you doing? I'm here. <laughs> we have a kind of a special guest with us today. We got Jason's son, Harrison, here. So he's gonna he's a big fan, so he wanted to be a part of this, and so we thought we'd we'd have him sit in as well. Hello. All right. So, you know, a lot of people spend most of their lives trying to find whatever it is that their, you know, their purpose is. So, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome that you already have a legacy, you know, to, to leave behind. But I know that Jason said also that your, uh, your, your son, right? Canyon. And he's kind of following in your footsteps, correct? Well, I've had five sons and all five of my sons have gotten division one college scholarships and all five have played professional On my youngest, I just made the Olympic team for three X three. Great. Okay. That's, that's awesome. All right. And you just, you're fresh back from playing a uh, pickleball three medals, right? I won the triple crown. Yes. Very cool. Well, I mean, obviously um, I'm sure that you're probably tired of hearing this question because most, most people always ask about the, uh, the underhanded shot, but I think that um, Harrison actually has a question about just that. So I'm going to go ahead and let him ask that. So obviously like, you're up there free throw shooters with like the greats of Steph Curry, Larry Bird, Steve Nash. And obviously you had a very unique style with the underhand shot. Why do you think no one else has picked up on that since you were so lethal, like such a lethal shooter in that, like with that form? I, I, I wish I had the answer to it. I don't know. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's proven by physicists to be the most efficient way and the best way to shoot free throws, the least amount of moving parts. And yet nobody wants to do it because they're worried about the way that they look. Who the hell cares how you look? The whole idea is try to shoot the highest percentage you can. I mean, if I could have stood there with my back to the basket with a blindfold on and thrown them over my head and made a higher percentage, I would have done it that way. I was going to do it the way that made the highest percentage possible. And I was able to do that. I just wish I was smart enough to have changed my technique earlier in my career, which I did late in my career, and I still think I am the best because Steph, I think, is the best around 92%. But in my last six years, I shot over 92%. My last two years, I shot over 94% from the free throw line. And I'll brag about it because it's the only part of the game of basketball that you can be selfish and help your team. And my youngest son, Kenyon, playing now, he's been as high as 90%, and he is shooting them underhanded. Rick, I, I love the bravada there, um, you know, on a very small level, I led the county in three-point shooting, but they said it looked like it was a two-hand shot put. I was a 48% shooter, you know, from the three-point arc, and shot looked absolutely terrible. With It was flat. There was no rotation on it. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, like, away from the free-throw line. You're also known as one of the better shooters, greatest shooters. You're right in that conversation. Talk to us a little bit about the confidence and what you were thinking when the ball, you know, left the fingertips at, at a crucial time in the game. Well, first of all, I was not a great shooter. Uh, I was a great scorer. Big difference between the two. Guys on television, especially when I hear former players talking and they're saying, well, this guy's a lockdown defender. Well, then, obviously, they got locked down some by the time of their career. But trust me, you can't lock down a scorer, okay? Nobody ever locked me down. And nobody, and there's no way. I have too many ways to beat you. But a shooter can be locked down because you're one-dimensional. 
And so that's why you have to have a well-rounded game, I think, when playing it. And so I got to be a better shooter uh, as I got into my career. Uh, I was not a bad shooter by any stretch of imagination. In fact, if I were playing today, uh, I got to like 33% from three-point range because I never shot from that far out. Hell, if I shot from that far out, coaches would have put me on the bench, especially my father I was younger. And, uh, and and it's just a matter of, again, and you, you made it one word, the, the, the best word you could have used. It's confidence. That's the biggest thing in life. When I have talks for people, business people and everybody else, the most important thing when you are learning to do something in life, whether it's basketball, whether it's music, whether it's, uh, acting, it doesn't matter, whatever the profession is, you have to learn the fundamental principles and concept of what it's about. Never stop learning. That's the foundation that you're laying. And then you have the foundation to build on. I always tell people, you can't build the, a tall building without a big foundation. And the fundamentals are the foundation. And then you go over and over and you practice and you're always trying to refine it. You're always trying to get better like I did with my free throws. And what you develop is you develop great confidence in your ability to do what it is you've trained to do. And if you've learned to do that, you'll eliminate the other word that is used so often. I almost want to throw up every time I hear it. And I hear it so often in every walks to life, the word pressure. There is no pressure when you have confidence in your ability to do what it is you've trained to do. I never felt pressure in my life on a basketball court. If I could have controlled it, I would have wished that every game I played and came down to the last 10 seconds, the ball in my hands and the game on the line. I live for those situations. I thought that I would every time. Now, was I? Of course I wasn't. You know, nobody's perfect. God wasn't perfect for God's sake. I mean, he sent the sun down, the sun got crucified for heaven's sake. So, yeah, you just have to believe in yourself and your ability to do what it is you've trained to do, and you can eliminate pressure from the equation. But how many times you oh, pressure's really on, pressure this, pressure that. Now, can pressure become a factor? Yes, it can. But if you analyze it, which I did, in certain things in life, let's say in basketball, the situations become very critical and very demanding, right? You have the ball, there's five seconds to go, and it's a tie game or you're down one. That's a pretty important situation, but it's not a pressure situation. It's a very demanding situation. And you have to believe in yourself that you can succeed in those situations and be willing to fail because you're going to fail. Some players will never want to take the shot because why? They're afraid to fail. I always tell young people, never be afraid to fail. That's a, that's a great oh. message there, Rick. You know, having uh, Harrison on here, my son, I told him the other day that sometimes you got to go back in the locker room and having teammates question, hey, why did you take that shot? But it's having the courage to take that shot. So I've I've studied as much as I can about your game, about you. Uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, the question that I would have is, did you work extremely hard to get to the line knowing that you were a high percentage shooter or did you just kind of play your game and that was the residual of how the game flow was going? Well, you used the word there that doesn't apply. Because here's the thing. I, I always tell young people and people who are in, in older as well. If you don't love what you do, you've got a job. But if you love what you do, it's not a job. It's not hard work. Hell, I'd love to do that. I would go out when I was in high school. I could, I'd have in, in, this, in the summertime, my mother would make breakfast and fix a lunch for me. And she wouldn't see me until dinner time. Where would I go? I went to the park. If no, nobody was there, I practiced all by myself. Drill, practice all the time. If somebody's there, you play. You just keep working at your craft. And so it's not work. It's something you look forward to. And that's why you don't want to be a person who gets up in the morning and says, I got to go to work today. I tell young people, I said, I was able to say, I get to go play basketball today. And someone is paying me to do this. Now, unfortunately, when I played, they forgot three zeros on my contract. But it <laughs> Kind of leading into that, uh, we were talking earlier, we had had um, Bob Nedelecki on uh, a few weeks back, and I know he's big into the Dropping Dimes Foundation. Um, I, From what I understand, you're also a big part of that? I've tried to help with, as much as I possibly could. It's it's, it's a great thing that, uh, that was done, and it was trying to help out those players who didn't have a pension because the ABA players weren't included in the NBA as far as pensions were concerned, that a lot of guys were really struggling. And Scott Tartar's done an amazing job. Uh, I mean, he's, he deserves so much credit. I mean, 
what a what an effort he put forth and I, I tried to help him as much as I could over the years and he was very successful he was very determined and adamant about trying to get something for him and he actually did get the NBA to do something for those players but they had no obligation whatsoever to do that so it was really quite an achievement and anytime I could do something you buy signing special cards they could get sold or balls or whatever it may be to raise money to put it into that fund for those less fortunate players. I was happy to do that. That's cool. He got man of the year at the event there in Indianapolis and he's a great speaker. And then Dan Issel was the keynote just to kind of throw out kind of how I became aware of that organization. So I think that's great. So, um, yeah, great that he got that. Yeah, it's great that he got that award. I mean, he, he should, I mean, the the, the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame gives out awards for things and everything. I mean, special awards uh, outside of, you know, for your basketball playing or coaching or whatever. I think Scott, I, in fact, I may, I may have to do that. I think Scott deserves to receive an award for what he did. That was so incredible on his part to do what he did and to achieve what he achieved. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up. I may just do that. I'm going to call up the Hall of Fame and tell them they need to think about giving him a special award. We'd love it, man. And that's a great cause and a great, a great honor and just a great human being. I mean, putting his life on hold to, to really accomplish that and, and, and reward those guys for the hard work that they'd done. It wasn't like he was taking money and using it and paying. Exactly. It. So when I told him when you start selling this stuff, I said, look, when you start selling this stuff, start taking a percentage of those profits to get your money back. So the least come out of this hole. Yeah, I think the betterment in, in the in the heart and the mind's there. Um, let me ask you a question about the free throws. So I'm curious here. So if I go out and I shoot, you know, 100, 200 free throws, you go out and you shoot 100 or 200 free throws, I'm going to give you an opinion, but I want you to factor fiction this. Do you feel like you're less tired from a muscle structure after that 100, 200, 500 free throws than shooting kind of your traditional style at the line? Absolutely. That's why I say it's the much more efficient, the least amount of moving parts. You're in a natural position. Who stands around doing this? And who stands and walks around doing this? Yep. Oh, you're, you're standing here and you do this. Pretty simple. You know, so no question about it. But the amazing thing to me is I was the best free throw shooter on my teams. And then in practice, I would shoot more free throws than my, my, uh, my teammates. It was crazy. And I always thought – Coaches, I mean, when I coached, I changed things a little bit with the free throws. I, you know, I try to tell guys if they like to, you know, do it, I would do it. I don't understand why owners and coaches and general managers don't make guys change. I mean, if you're paying your somebody millions of dollars and you suck at the free throw line, <laughs> you're shooting 40, 50, 60 percent from the free throw line. It should be required of you to have to try underhanded free throws. I mean, you're an employee. You need to do what your boss wants you to do. And these players say, no, how do they have the right? Where in the real world? Can an employee tell his boss he's not going to do what he wants him to do? With the uh, with the NBA now, though, and really any big athletic organization, I don't. I think that wins with them is only about half of what they're looking for. I think they're also looking for kind of what you were saying. You know, who cares if if somebody thinks this, that it looks weird? But I mean, they're performers now. You know, a lot of them. I think you know, and I think that's part of the reason why they make all the all the money that they that they do make. What What's kind of your take on that, about how it is now? I know you've had some opinions on even the three-point shot and, and that sort of thing. So what, you know, what's kind of your take on ne how players are now versus how you think that they should be getting paid what they what they make? Well, they're, they're getting overpaid as far as I'm concerned, but obviously if the money wasn't there, they wouldn't get it. So God bless them for that. They're very fortunate. They should be going to church and lighting candles and thanking God that they're so fortunate. <laughs> uh, like, very much. Like, well, with foundations and things of that nature, and I'm really happy to see them doing that because, I mean, how much money do you need to live on, for God's sake? Um, but I don't think they, a lot of them don't appreciate it, I think, as much as they do. Um, but they still should not be allowed to do what they want to do as an employee. They are. They're employees. I don't care how great you are and how talented you are. You are still an employee. It's not like you are a singer who goes and makes records and somebody decides to buy your records and you make money off of that. You're working for an organization. You are an employee of that organization. And your boss is entitled to demand that you do things a certain way, the way the, t the team or the organization wants to conduct business. And if you suck at a certain part of the business, well, then by God, you should have to do it the right way in order to get your salary. I don't understand why they don't take a stronger position on that. I mean, certain people say, no, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, Shaq, I'm not going to do it. I remember Andres Bejans for the Warriors. 
Don Nelson, before he got he got fired, but Beejans shot 18 and a half or 19% from the free throw line. Can you imagine? I would have slipped my wrist probably. <laughs> I mean, close your eyes and just shoot it up there. You could, yeah. Yep. Don Nelson, then, hey, you're going to do this. You're going to have to shoot and learn how to shoot underhanded free throws. And he said, I'm not going to do that. Well, you know, he said, if you're not going to do that, you're going to be on the team. And then Nelson got fired. But I was, you know, I was proud of Don for taking a position like that. Players should not be able to dictate what they're going to do or not do. You should always be striving to get better. And if you're deficient in a certain area of the game, you should be out there practicing and working on and required to have to make a change in order to improve yourself in that area. I love the take on that. You know, when um, when I, when I'm coaching and seeing stuff and, you know, at a small level, you know, the younger guys, it's all about the fundamentals. I think, you know, the the bounce pass, you don't have to go no look and three dribbles between, you know, just hit the basic stuff. But it also, it has to be a game. It has to be a game situation. You can't just take your time, line your, line your steps up, line your shoulders up, square and shoot. Sometimes you just got to shoot off balance, you know, off one leg drawing the defender what do you think what do you think uh what do you think back in your era could be brought back today and still be successful as far as uh maybe a style of play a uh a technique like what what do you see would be good in today's nba world actually running a play to create a shot for someone <laughs> instead of one-on-one -on -one. <laughs> that love would it. be interesting wouldn't love it? it love it that's one of the the things why the Warriors were so successful during that run that they had is because they passed the ball. They passed, they moved, they cut, they forced. My father always told me he was a semi-pro player and coach and the one that got me to shoot the free throws that way. Thank God he was relentless about doing because I didn't want to do it, obviously, because the same reason, oh, that everybody's going to make fun of me. He said, son, they can't make fun of you if you're making them. And I always remember that. And so, in fact, I actually remember the first time I shot him when I made the switch over in high school and I was in Scotch Plains, New Jersey on the road. I was shooting a free throw and a guy from the stands yelled at that, hey, Barry, big sissy, shooting like that. And I heard perfectly clear the guy next to him say, what are you making fun of him for? He doesn't miss. <laughs> and from that, <laughs> I, and, and so that's, that's an important element of it. But yeah, um, I always remember we have plays. There's plays designed. You always take what the defense gives you. And the more decisions you force the defense to make, the more the likelihood they'll make a mistake. And if you have fundamentally sound players, you will take advantage and recognize those mistakes, and you'll get things other than the play that you run. Because it's rare that a play, when you design a play, will run through it to a conclusion exactly like it's put on paper. Because the defense will do something else. If that happens, you react to that and you take advantage of the opportunity that presents itself. You have something, the guy's out of position, screw coming off and running off and getting the ball coming out to the left side. You back cut the guy. And that's sound fundamental basketball. I just like to see more of that being played because, first of all, it's fun to watch. It's fun to play that way. And you'll be more successful doing it. Rick, you gave me cold chills with that answer, man. I got to be honest with you. Hoosiers was filmed 20 miles from where we're at in the studio in Indianapolis. Um, you can't be more right on that. You know, give that give that one foot jab out there at the corner line and back cut somebody. I think I think if the, that fundamental play would come back at a young age, it would be a natural thing as opposed to, well, you don't need to dribble between the leg three, four times. Not taking away from the pros, just trying to make that fundamental thing. So I, I really like that. Let's talk a little bit of pickleball. Let's talk a little bit of pickleball. Um, oh, yeah. Explain to the audience what the Triple Crown, I know you kind of touched on it a little bit. And ironically, Rick, I had a guy in Naples actually speak with you there in the tent village, he said. They had like a little village set up for people to kind of cool off a little bit. Uh, you talked to a lot of people there, I'm sure, but he got a chance to uh, speak with you briefly. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what exactly the Triple Crown is and uh, that accomplishment and how much it meant to you there at the uh, recent U.S. Open for Pickleball. Well, in pickleball, you can play singles, men's doubles, or mixed doubles, and then they have skill and age categories. And so I had only been playing, and I've been playing for several years, uh, doubles, men's doubles, and mixed doubles, because I just thought singles might be too hard on my knee. I have no cartilage, and I've had four knee operations. And I just said, geez, I don't know. And But my knee's been really great uh, and doing well. And I just said, you know what? i, I got to find something else to go for, because I, I – I wanted to win some major national, you know, national tournaments, and I've won the world seniors and men's doubles and mixed doubles, and so when I've won the U.S. Open and I've won the USA Pickleball Nationals and all of those divisions in different categories, and so I said, "What can I do differently?" And so I said, well, "You know what? I'm going to try maybe singles." 
and I love the singles because it's all on me. I don't have to worry how my teammate plays, okay? And when you play, you always take advantage of the opponent's weaknesses, right? You exploit the weaknesses of your opponent. So I'm a better player if I'm better than my partners. Well, heck, you know, sometimes I would play in the mixed doubles and all, and they would be hitting everything at my partner. So I had to find and look to find great partners who could play well and be able to carry the burden of having to play at a high level in order for us to be victorious. So when I did the singles, I really got into it and I really liked it a lot. And so i worked hard at it. I played with much younger people, really some good players. You know, they were kicking my butt and doing stuff, but the redeeming thing was I'd hit a shot and they'd get something back. And I said, a great shot, David. I said, but you know what? I know that some 80 year old is never going to get that shot back. So it's okay. So it was really good for me because it forced me to have to play and elevate my game when I played against them. And so my goal with them is to try to get more and more points. I wasn't going to necessarily beat them. I was trying to beat them every time. And even though I wasn't winning, which I hate losing, uh, it was making me a better player. And, and I, basically dominated when I finally played in the U S open. I mean, I think the most points anybody got to me, we played games to 15. One person got 10 points. And a lot of those points were because I made some unforced errors and gave them some points that I probably shouldn't have, but I, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I really enjoyed the singles. So now my goal is to try to win the triple crown and the, and the world senior championships coming up in October and the USA pickleball nationals in November. So, uh, We'll see what happens. But a lot of that is predicated on how my partners do. My immense partner, friend Fred Shuey, who and I play together, he's out of San Diego. I was really proud of him because actually Fred, I thought, played better than he's ever played before with me uh, this year. We won the 75 to 79 last year in the U.S. Open. And we won We won, and we, we dominated in the uh, in the 80s. And so that was kind of cool. And I was proud of him. And then my soup. Uh, you know, Sue Matthews, a lady from Naples, actually, who I found. I had everybody I knew. I was searching the country. I was calling everybody I knew. I got to find an 80-year-old who's a four-row, <laughs> at least a four-row player who can play. And they found Sue for me down in Naples. And Sue was absolutely great. We played terrifically. And uh, and we we basically dominated in that as well. So uh, when you play doubles, you, your partner has to be good. So it was it was good. Great experience. It's uh, I had to find something for the competitive juices that flow in me all the time. One of the hardest things when I gave up basketball and had re and retired was finding something else to compete in and so i actually played a lot of golf i got to be like a one handicap golfer and i found world long driving um and so i got into that and i was i actually won four world long driving championships in my age category and then they cut all of the old farts out they wouldn't let us compete anymore and so i said oh boy what am i going to do now my wife was the one that introduced me to pickleball and she's a great athlete in all america basketball player in fact she and my youngest son, Canyon, have the distinction of the in the history of NCAA basketball, the only mother and son who have both been first team academic All Americas. And my son was actually wow. the academic player of the year in his last year at Florida. That's so fantastic. that's a pretty special thing. And my wife's the only woman to have her jersey retired at her college at William and Mary. And she ran USA basketball for for uh, 12 years. And, and uh, so she's she's a great uh, great athlete and it was a great student and fortunately in that area my son takes after her <laughs> hey rick i got a question i'm going to take a stab here um did was she integral part of starting or helping start the wnba or am i or am i wrong there i tried to do some online research oh huge factor i mean nobody ever talks about it but okay. you know val Ack was picked as the president of the of the N of wnba by david stern uh you know a, Obviously, he, she wasn't given the title commissioner. <laughs> she was given the title of president of the WNBA, and she did a great job. She's a former college player, and she and my wife were friends because my wife knew her for over the years, you know, running USA Basketball for Women. And my wife, uh, they asked her because she had uh, retired from USA Basketball, and, and they asked her if she would come and be the special uh, assistant, special advisor to Val Ackerman. So she... She helped them get all the foreign players. She helped them set up their training. I mean, my wife knew more about women's basketball than anybody at the WNBA, and she was an integral part of getting that started up for the first five years. So I went to a little cornfield school, Rick, believe it or not, with about 80 or 90 people, and uh, a young lady that graduated from there went to Notre Dame, won the national title, and then she's an exec in the WNBA. Her name's Ruth Riley, so that was uh, – I've always respected that. Here in Indianapolis, we got the blessing. We got Caitlin Clark here lo locally. 
kind of putting put them on the map for that. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk one last sport. It's rare that you get to talk three sports in one day, and then we're going to respect your time from there. But talk to us a little bit about fishing. Where do you like to fish? What do you like to fish for? And uh, we'll uh, kind of go from there. I was never a fisherman to start with. My dad would take me sometimes. I always remember the guy's name. His name is John Danick, and my father would take me out. I remember the first time I went and I caught a, a New Jersey bluefish. It was only two and a half pounds, but I was a young kid at the time. I thought I had a whale on the line. I always remember that experience. And But I, I wasn't into fishing because I'm an A-type personality. I mean, to sit there and hold the rod in your hand and have a line in the water and just sit there and hope that a fish decides to swim by and bite that whatever that was on the end of the line, that's not my idea of a whole lot of fun. And so I got introduced to fly fishing. And uh, fly fishing is really an art form. I mean, it's a skill that you have to develop. And the better I got at my casting, every time I would go out, I'd get these good guides and i just tell them, look, give me some pointers, tell me what I can do how do i get better and that's the whole thing like i say in anything you do in life never be satisfied with what they're doing always strive to get better and even now i've gotten to be pretty good at it but i still always ask if a guide starts to look if you see something i'm doing that i can make better please let me know or if you've got some other pointer or tip to, to let me know about please tell me and you know i'm a long way from being you know super great caster and in fly fishing because some of these guys are amazing they have these competitions of what they can do and where they can put a fly it's amazing so i got into that uh, I love it. Uh, it's just, it's a great adrenaline rush. Every strike that I get is, uh, is just a super high. I love, I love it. And I'm, I'm a numbers guy. I mean, it's fun. I can go out and sometimes just one episode, one fish, if you catch it, you track it down and you get it and all makes the whole day, but more enjoyable for me is numbers. And so I would go out and the guides that I would go to, and I go to Alaska, which this fishing up there is insane. How many fish there are. And so my goal got to be, I always wanted to hook at least a hundred fish. Now it's not about bringing them in because I know I could bring them in once I hook them and fine, but I, but you barbless hooks when you do it up there. And so I learned how to be able to put slack in line and get those hooks out of their mouth. Cause I didn't want to spend 10, 15 minutes exactly. trying to get, one. I got the strike. I got it. I put it where I had to do it. I got them. I hooked them. Now I want to get rid of them unless he was big enough and what I call picture worthy. So I had live a lot of pictures. But once you have, you know, you've got hundreds, hundreds of pictures of fish who are 20 inches long. I always laugh when I come back down to the lower 48. Somebody, oh, my God, it was a limbo. I said, he said, I went fishing you know, the other day. I said, I got a 20 incher. I said, really? That's great. I'm happy for it. Hell, I just get back from Alaska. I hook 110 fish in one day and 100 of them were 20 inches or more. So it's it's about the numbers. And so. I loved it. And my biggest day in Alaska is I went out with the guide. We flew up to a lake above where we were staying on one of the rivers. And they usually do float trips coming down. And we had a small raft with a motor. And we went through the slough. And usually they float back down. And they get picked up and go back to the lodge. Well, we went out of the slough. And then we took the motor. And we went up to where hardly anybody goes. And so the guide says to me, he says, Rick, he said, you know, they knew I'm serious. They said, you know, we should be able to get 100 today. I said, are you kidding? Just you and me with a boat going up where nobody doesn't go. We don't get a hundred. You might not get back to camp. I said, you got to put me on some fish. <laughs> he said, well, so I got so many fish so fast. He said, Rick, I think we can get 200 fish today if you want to do it. I said, let's go for it. And it was incredible. I mean, he pulled, he bring that in. He changed the fly. Let's go. Let's go. Boom. And the thing, go to another spot. So we come down to where we're going to down. The bend was coming where I knew we were going to pick picked up and go in the regular boats to take us home and drop off the raft. And I actually stopped because if my number was 24, I could have caught even more. I hooked 224 fish that day. It was unbelievable. And then now I got into my friend, Rob Anderson, who runs a lot of trips called bucket list fly fishing. You should check that out. If you're really into fly fishing folks, he's got places in pyramid Lake out in the Reno area in California and Reno area. And he's uh, he's got private, water that he made arrangements for down in the amazon jungle and we go for peacock bass and i've gotten you know 20 pound peacock bass on a fly rod wow and you're there and nobody else is there and it's big time numbers as well just super special trip uh to go on i just went with a group of guys in fact ed marinaro the former uh football player and actor a good buddy of mine uh, he went on the trip with me with some other friends and we just had an amazing amazing time I live myself uh, vicariously through that. I, I fished in a tournament. I'm kind of your triple A or your semi-pro fisherman, kind of fish out of the back of the boat. I play a lot of pickleball. I don't play as much basketball, but I'm kind of regarding to my son. I think Nick's got a question for you here as well. Yeah, just just to kind of move moving away from sports just a little bit. 
Um, you were talking about earlier about confidence and how important that is. You know, there's a lot of words out there right now that people love to throw out and are misused. But you're obviously a very confident guy. So where would you say, how would you distinguish between confidence and I know that you probably heard the word back in the day, arrogance used. Where would you, where would you oh. draw, draw the line between the two of those? Compliment to you. You're the first person in all these years they've done that actually understands that that's, that's the, yeah, I've been called arrogant. Okay. <laughs> I am not an arrogant person. To, an arrogant person to me is someone who really lacks confidence in themselves. And it's a camouflage mechanism to hide the fact that they're scared shitless. Okay. And <laughs> arrogant person, Anybody is an arrogant person, they're bullshit, okay? Because they don't have the confidence that they need to have. I'm an extremely confident individual, and that scares the hell out of people, okay? Yeah. And so, yeah, there, there's a huge difference between the two. I don't think I'm ever better than anybody else as a person. Do I think I'm better as a player? Hell yeah. Yeah. Because exactly. why? Because I worked at it. I trained to get that. I'm sure I think I'm better than you. Why the hell would I go out and go and think somebody's better than me when I'm out there playing? Are there guys who maybe were better than me? Yeah, of course. But the thing is, is I'd be more than happy. And like people say to me, Rick, you couldn't play with these guys today. I said, are you on drugs? Do you understand what you're saying? <laughs> I had zero help other than what I was told by coaches to work on. Zero. I didn't have a strength coach. I didn't have an agility coach. I didn't have a dietitian. We traveled commercially. We didn't go on commercial flights and get good night's sleep after games. We get to bed at two o'clock in the freaking morning after going out with our eight dollars per day per diem to find something to eat. Get up at six o'clock in the morning or five thirty to catch a commercial flight to get to the next uh, next city to play a game the next night. Hope that your freaking uniform that you used to wash in the shower got dried before the game that night. These guys are so spoiled and so yeah. catered to they get done they have they get on they get on chartered flights to get to the next city they have chartered food and stuff and catered food to have a great meal while they're getting there get a good night's sleep stay in great hotels you know four seasons you know whatever it is and it's a different world i would be faster stronger quicker more endurance jump higher i would be so much better a basketball player because i knew the game I had the fundamentals and I understood how to play. And if I had all of that other stuff to help me be scary, how much better I would be. Where, have you always had that kind of confidence, even since a kid? Like, how was that how you were brought up by um, by your folks? Or? It's not something that only shows up that you all of a sudden have. It's a characteristic that's inbred in you. Hell no. Confidence comes from putting the time and the effort forth, to, like I said, to learn the fundamental principles and concept, to try to always get better at all facets of whatever it is you're studying to try to learn how to do and keep doing it over and over again. That's how confidence comes about. You know, failing, you know, learning, failure, making sure you don't make the same mistakes over again. Do it better the next time. It's a, it's a, it's a growing situation that you grow according to the amount of time and effort you're willing to put forth to be able to get better at what you're doing. And then you can believe in yourself. hundred percent agree. Rick, I think on the pickleball court, you know, I've, I've spent eight years and I haven't paid for a paddle. You know, I've taught hundreds of people how to play. I'm a certified instructor. So the thing that's cool about that is, is I'm thinking in my mind, how can I train myself to be an elite player as a 50 year old? Cause I'm 45 right now. And I'm kind of at that middle age to where it's hard to play with a 20 year old it's easier to play with someone a few years older, but I think think what I'm hearing from you is is just go after it. You're not fly fishing just to fly fish. You're out there to put it in a five gallon bucket space. You know, if you're playing basketball, you're there to be the best. You're there to push that. You know, when I tried out for the basketball team in college, I didn't make it, but guess what? When we ran the mile out on a 90 degree heated track, I was running a five minute mile and dusting people going into a heated gym, best condition athlete there. So I really appreciate that. And quite frankly, it's inspirational to hear that not only are you confident, you're engaged, you're staying busy. I mean, people 30 years younger than you, with all due respect to you, don't do half of what you do from a mental standpoint, from a confidence standpoint, in multiple sports. So I just want to tip my cap to you in that. You're right in what you're saying, because I started pickleball, I was in my 70s, okay? And it's my first tournament that I ever won, when a guy asked me, he said, what's against 50-year-olds? And because... It, what, it, it, in pickleball, the age is not the major factor. It's your ability to play the game the right way. Now, are they going to be a little quicker than you? Of course they are. 
I mean, they're going to be a little quicker. You know? Okay, they can jump a little bit higher. You know, but I still have great hands and reaction stuff, and I love it sometimes when I'm playing doubles and people hit power shots and everything. The game's becoming more and more, as you know, if you're an instructor, it's become more of a power game. Everybody's starting to hit, and I am myself. I mean, I got you know, my Selkirk stuff. Selkirk gives me paddles. I mean, I got their new Lux paddle, and it's unbelievable. The top spin and stuff, my top spin drives, and all awesome. But they start hitting them to me. If if you have great hands, man, I'd love for people to hit it at me. I mean, that, that's just crazy. I mean, you know what they say, like, like uh, you know, like in pitching, right? You used to say, you know, throw it where they ain't, you know, or hit it where they ain't. I mean, that's the whole idea is make somebody move, especially when I'm playing against some even older people. If I'm going to make them move, I'm going to have to make them make a difficult shot as opposed to if they've got good hands and you hit it to them, they don't have to move. Exactly. Yep. Hey, Rick, I'm going to end you with a question here. You, you've you done a great insight of what you're about, what you do, what motivates you. And man, it was just a pleasure talking with you. It, it, it kind of seemed like I'd known you for a lot of years, and I really like the fact that you were very candid and open with us. I'm going to I'm going to give a little bit of a tribute to my son here uh, practicing out in the in the in the driveway. Thirteen year old. What advice do you have to him as far as his journey that he's about to embark on and what would make him successful in your eyes, 13 years old through the rest of his basketball cl- uh, playing days? Well, forget the basketball. It's just in life in general. Okay. I mean, basketball is secondary. So your number one priority has to be your education. You need to apply yourself and try, like you say, always try the best that you can. My dad instilled that. I mean, give your best effort in everything you do. And especially in the classroom, because and have a goal, you know, you want to try, think you can become good enough to get a college, you know, college education or scholarship playing basketball. God bless you. Try for it. Go for it. But focus on your grades because get your grades, get your education, find something you have a love and passion for outside of the basketball and study as much about it as you can. I did that. I did that radio, TV and film work when I was in college. I got my, my degree in, in uh, marketing, but I had so many elective courses, but they wouldn't allow you to have another major or even a minor in the business school. But I had so many courses and credits in radio, TV, and film work. That's one of the reasons why I was able to go and get into the broadcasting world and do that for so many years, because I I trained and studied to be able to become good at it. I mean, I still watch stuff now. I mean, and I'm listening to these people who are doing interviews on national programs and stuff, and they still have no idea how to answer. There's someone, I'm not going to mention his name because he actually is somebody that I know, is one of the worst (laughs) interviewers ever, ever. I I mean, the whole thing is, is when you have a guest on and you have a show, the guest is the person who should be doing most of the talking, not you. And when you talk to somebody, if you ever get to this point in life when you're doing it, never ask a question that could be answered yes or no. Never. Right. Never. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Never. It's the worst possible thing in the world. <laughs> they go on and on and on and then give their opinion about stuff and then go to the guy and ask a question or stop after their opinion and expect the person to have something to respond to. I mean, I, I, go to, I just cringe when I see this <laughs> with the experience that I've had. And I'm saying, how are these guys doing and getting paid the kind of money? They're absolutely awful. Just listen sometimes. But hey, the Rick. best thing is effort. When you put your head on the pillow at night, you want to sleep good. And you should be able to sleep good, even if you failed that day and what you tried to do, as long as you gave your best effort and you learned from the experience that you had, that's the most important thing. And you should be happy with yourself and you should sleep peacefully that night. And if you don't, then you should have trouble sleeping knowing you let yourself down, not your parents, not the teacher, not yes. your coach, you. Yes. You have been happy with your effort and what you're doing in order to be successful in anything in life. That's great. Hey, Good. final final one to the final one here, Rick. I want to give you an opportunity if you'd like to mention any sponsors, any causes, anything personal in life, and where we can maybe find you if we would like to connect or network with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I think Rick 24 Barry's my stuff. I don't do crazy amounts of stuff on social media. But if anybody's uh, got aches and pains and doing stuff, I'll give you some things that you can put out there. I'm into the cannabinoid world, okay? You know, natural stuff as opposed to taking ibuprofen and all this other stuff that's horrible for you. And so uh, Medicileaf, M-E-D-I-C-I-L-E-A-F, M-E-D-I-C-I-L-E-A-F.com. If you go there, any of the products that are there, and they have some amazing products, the Platinum Pro Sav for, for if you've got discomfort and inflammation and every stuff, this stuff is off the charts. And RB, my initials, small RB24, my number, RB24 for all these things I'm going to tell you is the code to get a really nice discount, but awesome product. 
Same thing. We have there's another cream that we have for another company, and it, the, it's Aloe MD, A L O E M D dot com, Aloe MD dot com, and the product is called Ultimate Repair X. Ultimate Repair X. Put that code in there. That's an incredible cream. You don't need very much of that. I, I just you know I already put some on. I just got done taking a shower after I just worked out before I did this with you and. Put some of that stuff on. It's an amazing product. Uh, give that a shot, and you get the discount. And any of the other products on that site for you know if you've got if you're if you if you guys if you have your wife or whatever, there's all kinds of face cream and other really cool stuff. That RB24 code will work for them as well. And the last thing is if you got any problems with you know calf muscles or knees and stuff, I have no cartilage in my knee, and so these guys gave me these sleeves to try that have kinesio tape built into them. I've seen a lot of people with kinesio tape on, it peels off, whatever. This has got it built into them. And so I tried it. I liked it so much that I actually wear it on my good knee as well. I never play pickleball without my ghost sleeves. G-O-S-L-E-E-V-E-S.com, ghostsleeves.com. The runners are going crazy over it. We've got tons of football players are starting to wear it. The basketball guys need to use it. It's just an awesome product. I just rinse mine out and let it uh, air dry. And then you can drive, you know, I'm you can sometimes, if you really get super sweaty and stuff, you could just put a little mild detergent in there and do it on gentle cycle and just let it dry out. Don't stick it in the dryer for any length of time, but it lasts forever. Great product. Okay. Ghostsleeves.com, same RB24 code. Those are three things that I just absolutely love and, and swear by. I mean, they're, they're incredible. I just hope that they do for people who use them, what they've done for me. We'll make sure to get get all that stuff up on the screen and everything. But uh, last question: who who is your team now? Like when it comes to basketball, do you have it? Like who do you root for? Of course, the Warriors. Of okay, course. all right. I just I, I wanted I thought that's what you'd say, but I just wanted I just wanted to ask. <laughs> so right now I'm rooting for I, I'm I'm rooting for the Nuggets because I my two favorite players to watch are Steph Curry and the Joker. I, the Joker is un freaking believable this guy is the most efficient player i've ever seen there's never been anybody he's again a guy an anomaly there's never been a center like this guy in the history of basketball he is absolutely a joy to watch and if you understand the game if you're not impressed by what this guy does then you don't know the game this guy's incredible it's been a pleasure you're you're uh, high class it was great to speak with you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day yeah thanks so much for coming on Thank you. Bye-bye.